now found us every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for song of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming love here I raise my Ebenezer hither by thy help I'm come and I hope by Thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And unto the angel, the church of Laodicea, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye sad, that thou may seest, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning and, Lord, rich, meaningful passages like these that the Spirit of the living God moved on the heart of men to record 
so that we would have, Lord, your warning, your exhortation, your encouragement. And I do pray, God, today that you'd speak to us, speak to our hearts. and God, make this uh, message a personal message to each and every individual. Help them to realize that you're standing at the door of their heart and you're wanting access. And I pray, Father, that they would humbly and quickly open that door and invite Jesus Christ in. I pray, Father, that you would just guide this morning every word that I say. Help me, God, to say those things that you would have me to say. And keep me back from saying things, God, that I ought not to say. And let everything that's done this morning be done to your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. I went to pick up the kids this morning on the van, and I don't know if it was because time change or not, but uh, uh, no one was coming to the door, and uh, the apartments were still empty, and only Timothy came running up, and he said, I said, are you going to church today? He said, yes, and then he said, I'm the only one going, and, and he thought, that's a great thing, I'm the only one. <laughs> And then he thought, wait a minute, if I'm the only little kid going, that means I'm not going to be able to go to children's church. And he started rethinking coming to church. <laughs> and I said, Timothy, that's all right because I've got a message from the Lord and I've got a message for you. And he said, a message for me? A message for me from the Lord? And I said, yes, I have a message to you, to you personally from the Lord, out of his word. And the truth is, that's the way it is for every single one of us, amen? A message to me from the Lord. And when you read verse number 20, he's not just talking about 2,000 years ago and saying to them only, I want access. He's still wanting access this very day. Isn't that true? And so as you look at this passage, I hope that you'll consider the Lord's desire to come in and have an intimate relationship with you. This, of course, is Jesus standing outside a church that no longer needs him. That doesn't even sound like it should go together, does it? They are financially well off, but spiritually they are in a state of poverty. You realize that everything can be going well on the outside but really on the inside you're blind and wretched and miserable and you really things are not going well on the inside at all and people look at the maybe the success that you have and the money in the bank and they think wow that's wonderful and maybe even they conclude God must be blessing them and the truth is that's not the case at all just like the Laodicean church God had a great problem with that church. They continued to worship, but the candlestick was going out. It wouldn't be long until Christ would have no part of their worship whatsoever. They would show up, but He wouldn't show up. Think about His promise. He said, where two or three are gathered in My name, I'll be in the midst. And yet this whole church is gathered, and He's on the outside knocking on the door, wanting any man, one person, anyone, to open the door and let him in so that he can have fellowship with them. Isn't that amazing? And so I want you to consider this morning, first of all, the announcement. That is the picture that he gives us. He starts that verse with a really a, a word that should arouse our attention. <laughs> He's talking to the Laodicean church and all their needs, and then he says, Behold! Always when I read that, I think there should be an exclamation point right after that. That word demands uh, to gain your attention. It's crying out, Look at me and look closely and see! And I thank God that he uses that to gain our attention, don't you? That word means to look, see, or observe. It's used to excite particular attention to a hearer to some object of sight or some subject of discourse. In fact, back in Revelation chapter 1, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, look at this verse. Jesus is speaking. He's already said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And he says in verse 18, 
I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold. <laughs> I want you to stop now. I, 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 I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jude, writing in that little book before the book of Revelation, verse 14 says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. I want to get your attention so you'd stop and see it. This is a critical verse. And so the Holy Spirit says, Wait a minute. I need to say something so I can get them to see that I really want to speak to them about this subject. And so he says, stop, see, observe, look, behold. And I hope this morning that you will take the time to do that. That you'll stop and really think about what Jesus is saying. He's painting the picture of himself standing at the door of your heart, not just standing but knocking not just standing and knocking, but also calling out so that he might have access to you. You're the one this morning that he desires to have fellowship with. He's calling and knocking, standing there because he wants a closer relationship with you. He wants that Fellowship to be friendship and demonstrated by fellowship, right? Then notice the appearance. Look at the person. Behold, I stand at the door. And I'm not just trying to go through this slowly. I just want you to pay attention to the words. It's the one and only Jesus Christ that's come to you. Standing at the door of your heart. Think about that. The Lord Himself is crying out to you, coming to you, saying, this is what I desire. It's not the carpet cleaning salesman, right? It's not the Girl Scout selling cookies. It's not the cult at your door like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, that if you believe their doctrine, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. It's not a childhood neighbor that wants a cup of sugar. It's Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. In other words, he's far more important than any other person that could ever come to you and address you and request something from you and want a response from you. He is more important than anyone ever. Jesus Christ, and He's coming to you. It's not a congressman or a council member, right? It's not the chief of police here in town. It's not the mayor of the city of Jacksonville. Have you ever had the mayor or congressman come and knock on your door at your house? I've never had that. I mean, I know sometimes they still get out, but that's never happened. I wonder why that is, Brother John. They want our votes, right? But they never come to where we are. They don't seem to be interested in our conditions and what's going on with us, right? It's not the House of Representatives. It's not your senator. It's not the governor of the state. It's not an ex-president or the current president. Think about that. If one of those gentlemen were to walk up to your house and knock on your door, you would feel at least somewhat honored, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you feel like, wow, what is, what's going on here? This is the president of the United States. He's, come, he, he's, he's at my house? He's knocking on my door? What does he want? And the one we're talking about this morning far exceeds any person that you can imagine in this world, it's a, it's a mountain to a molehill, right? If Bill Gates or Warren Buffett were to come to your door, some of you would invite him in and say, listen, I want to learn finances and I want to know stuff, and would you sit down and explain? Or some star, a movie star, you'd be shocked that they knocked on your door and Christ far exceeds them all. And yet when he comes knocking, we are show little excitement or interest. Isn't that a shame? 
And yet He is knocking this morning, desiring that you would respond to His invitation. Remember who He is. He's the Creator of the entire world. All those people that we talked about, the leaders of the world, he, he made them, He formed them, He created them. He's the only one that has created everything, all things. John says in his Gospel, John chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, and the Word was God. That's not the full part of that, but that's... And then he says in verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him there was nothing made that was made. You say all things? I mean, He made everything, all things, and without Him there was nothing made that was made. If you look around in the galaxies and the universe and the stars of heaven and everything that's on the earth, He's the one that's made it all. And that Creator is knocking on your heart's door wanting access to you so He could have fellowship with you. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 says this, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven. When you look up and see the sun, the moon, the stars, and you hear of the endless galaxies that exist, those are His creation. How powerful is He to make all of those things? I mean, just study the sun if you want to, and it's a marvel, isn't it? Isn't that true? And He spoke it into existence just like that, out of nothing. All things that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Listen to me. By Him, and don't forget this last part, and for Him. So He created you. He's the one that's made you and He made you for Him. And that's why sometimes you live in this world and you think, what's the purpose? Why am I here? What's going on? What's this all about anyway? It, can't, it has to be more than just getting up, going to work, um, and coming home and repeat, 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 right? It has to be a whole lot more than that. There is. There's a God who made you and you are to be for Him. And until you start living for Him, you won't even know what life's really about. You may entertain yourself for a little while, but that'll get old, amen? So the Eternal One, the Creator, the Maker of all things is standing at the door of your heart. And the question is, will you answer Him? How could you ignore Him? Amen? How is that even possible? Right? And yet I'm afraid that He is still knocking at some doors, right? Not only is He the Creator, but He is also the Christ. That, he, that means He is the Messiah, the Anointed One. He is the one long promised in the Scriptures that would come and make all the wrong right. He is prophesied of as early as Genesis 3.15. And all throughout the Old Testament, He is spoken of and alluded to and talked about and pictured and painted. And, and, and we see Christ Christ, the Messiah, the Anointing One. He is coming and this Christ is going to come and He is going to lay His life down on the cruel cross so that we can have salvation and forgiveness of our sins. And this, is, this, is a, this is the one who went up Calvary's hill and suffered and bled and died so that you wouldn't have to spend eternity in hell because of your sins. This Christ is the one that's knocking at your heart's door. Isaiah chapter 53, some 700 years before Christ's birth in Bethlehem. Think about that. The prophet prophesied these words in verses 5 and 6, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. In other words, if we're going to have peace with God, 
It was only going to come through His suffering on the cross and His uh, chastisement. God's wrath would be poured out on Him and because that wrath was poured out on Him for our sins, then we could have peace with God through the suffering of His Son on the cross. Notice, He wasn't on the cross because of His iniquities and His transgressions and His sins. He was on the cross because of our iniquities, our transgressions, and our sins. In verse 6, it all we like sheep have gone astray. And everyone has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Creator that would condescend to this earth and be born of a virgin, laid in a manger, live a sinless life, and then lay that life down, dying the death of the crucifixion, the most horrible death that anyone could die. And that's the one that's standing at your heart's door, knocking, calling, let me in. You got any time for me today? Can I come in and sit down with you a little, little while and have some fellowship with you today? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says these words, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Isn't that a powerful thought? The innocent, pure, sinless Son of God took your horrible, wretched, vile sin upon Himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Glory to God in the highest. Yes. Amen? Amen? Matthew 27, verse 35, it says these words, and they crucified Him and parted His garments, casting lots. Now, I'm not going to review this morning the suffering of Jesus on the cross, but I want to ask you to go back in Matthew 27 and meditate on every word and every phrase and realize all the suffering that Christ went through and the humiliation that He endured and the guilt that weighted Him down on that cross because of Him bearing your personal sins against God. And He's saying, God, instead of judging Tommy and, and casting him in, into hell because of all his wicked, ungodly, filthy sins, pour out that wrath on me and judgment on me, I'll take the full blow of that sin's judgment on myself so he wouldn't have to endure that suffering in hell separated from you and that's what he's done for you and he and he's knocking and he can't get access in to our hearts after he's done all of that Acts 1.11 he's also the soon coming king amen you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus? And I just love those, little, those three little words, don't you? This same Jesus. Which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. I'm trying to get you to understand this morning. He is saying in Revelation 3.20, Stop and look and think about this. I am standing at the door of your heart. Who's the I? We didn't go and knock on His door. That's how it should be, right? It should be reversed. We should be before Him, seeking Him, desiring Him, but He has to pursue us over and over and over again. And the Creator of the world and Christ that died on the cross and the King that's coming again is the one that's coming to you and saying, let me in so that I can have some time with you. This same Jesus shall come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. One of these days he's going to rise to the throne of David, sit on that throne in Jerusalem, and rule this earth for a thousand years as King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? All the nations of the earth shall go down and bow before him. 
All over the earth, they'll flood to Jerusalem to be in the presence of the king and bow before the king. And there they'll learn the law of the Lord. And now this king has come to you and he is knocking at your door saying, see how he is so much better, greater, far greater than any person that could ever come to you and say, hey, let's sit down and have some fellowship for a little while. That's him, right? You used to sing a song about that's him, right? The Rose of Sharon, the Morning Star, the Alpha, and Omega, the beginning and the end, that's him. That's him knocking at your heart's door and the question is this morning, will you answer him? And then notice finally this morning the answer. Have you ever been at your house and someone knocked on your door and you didn't go to the door? Anybody got a testimony and say, yep, that's happened to me a lot. I'm at the door, people knock on my door, I know they're out there, and I'm not going. <laughs> and usually who is it? <laughs> Isn't that sad? You know the answer should be Baptist. Right? And so we know they're knocking, we know somebody's out there, but we just don't go. Especially around Halloween time, right? I'd rather have the, the trick than them get a treat. You know? <laughs> Whatever you're going to throw the eggs, I don't care, I'll wash it off in the morning. But I've been at my house and people knock on my door and I said, I'm, listen, I'm not going to go to the door. Maybe it's a salesman, maybe it's some you know, cult that's trying to lead me away from Christ. Uh, usually if they come, they're coming down the streets, everybody comes to me and say, Daddy, Daddy, get ready for them. <laughs> and I'll go out there and try to persuade them if I can. But you know what it's like for someone to be at your door and not for you to answer. Sometimes we don't answer because we're distracted, right? Someone may have said later on to you, I came by, but you didn't answer. The car was there, and you may say, well... Uh, you know, I was busy at that time. I was doing something else. And I just want to say to you this morning, Satan will do everything he can to keep you distracted from saying, yes, Jesus, I want to come to you. Amen. You see, he plays those games all the time. He's really good at it. If he can just keep you busy and keep you away from Jesus, he's winning the battle, Right? The longer he can keep you away from Christ, the colder your heart's going to get. The further from God you're going to get. The, the, the more worldly you're going to be. The, the less spiritual you're going to be. The less you'll tell others about Christ. The less you'll be a witness for God. And so he'll do his best just to keep you as distracted as he can. So you won't have any time for Jesus at all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says these words, in whom the God of this world, and by the way, that's the little G-O-D, the one who is currently ruling and making a mess of everything. Amen? Amen? The God of this world who hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus has given the parable of the four seeds sown in the different, uh, the seed sown in the different types of soil, those four types of soil. He tells about the wayside soil in verse number 12, that those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. You see, the seed was planted, the gospel was there, it even got on the heart and touched the heart and affected the heart, but Satan comes quickly and he snatches it away because he doesn't want them folks saved, you see? He's doing that work all the time. And by the way, there's a third type of ground as well, right? And that's that thorny ground, Christian. What's going on in the thorny ground? Oh, it, it comes up, it sprouts, it should be bearing fruit, but it can't bear any fruit. Why? Because the cares of this life and the pursuit of riches have not caused it to be able to bear fruit. What does that sound like? It sounds like a bunch of Christians that have been distracted by this current world and they want whatever it has for them 
and they forgot all about Jesus altogether, and so there's no fruit being produced in their life to God's glory. Isn't that what it sounds like? They're distracted. And all the while, Jesus is knocking. And sometimes we don't answer because of disinterest, right? I don't care who it is, and I don't care what he's telling. Have you ever said that? I don't care what he's telling. It may be a miracle potion that causes you to lose weight. I better get interested. <laughs> There's no miracle potion, by the way. Just self-denial, exercise. But It may be something fantastic. I remember a guy knocked on our door one time and Cody answered the door. And he said, let me show you this cleaning uh, product here. <laughs> he he sprayed it, and man, it just brightened something, cleaned it. Cody's like, wow. He said, let me, let me show you what it does on your car. It brightened it up. He said, wow. And look over here at the concrete. It'll even clean concrete. You can clean anything with this. Walls, wood, cars, concrete, clothes. Needless to say, he left with having Cody's money in his pocket and a bottle of cleanser at our house. And I don't know if we ever use it again. I don't know. You have to ask Cody about that. <laughs> but just disinterest, right? Listen to me. You can be disinterested in math. And, listen, you can be disinterested in math and science and English and geography. You can be disinterested in your health. You could be disinterested in your friends and your family. You can be disinterested in employment and resources to take care of your personal needs, food, shelter, clothing. But don't you dare be disinterested in where you're going to spend eternity and fellowship with Christ. I was going downtown uh, uh, yesterday and I noticed on the side of the road people are just disinterested in the world. They're living for what they can get off of people that pass by with the car and hand them money. No, no house, no, just the clothes on their back. They could care about nothing else in the world but just whatever they get from the next car that passes by. And I thought, how sad is that? But I hope they're not disinterested in where they're going to spend eternity. Amen? Right. And you can't afford to be disinterested in Christ coming to you and listen to me. How dare a Christian be disinterested in the Lord knocking at their door right. after all that He's done for us. Amen? Amen. You know, we, we have a, a family that drops in sometimes unexpectedly at the house and visits with us. It's Uncle Lewis and Aunt Carolyn. And sometimes we're totally unprepared for them. Sometimes they're in town and we hadn't planned for them to come by at all and they just show up. And you know what? When we first hear that they're outside, we're like, oh no. But we're always so glad that they come in and spend some time with us. Amen? And I promise you this morning, you'll be glad when Jesus comes in and spends some time with you as well. Amen? And sometimes it's not because of disinterest, it's because of distrust. And you say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, the devil's convinced some of you if you give your life to Jesus, he's just going to take your life and just destroy it. Right? Remember when you were lost and you thought, man, if I get saved, that's the end of everything. I can't laugh no more. I can't have fun no more. I, 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 you can't do this. You can't do that. What do Christians do? You know? You can't go to the bar. You can't go dancing. You, I mean, everything that seems like is fun in the world, Christians say. And then I started going to church. I went to church and people were laughing and they were joyful and excited. And I thought, what in the world y'all got to be excited about? You can't do nothing. And I didn't know the joy of salvation and the joy of having a right relationship with God and the peace of laying your head on the pillow at night knowing I don't have to worry about where I'm going to spend eternity. Amen? 
And some of you have been fooled by the devil. He is a threat to you. He is bullying you. And you don't even realize what's going on. There was a family, or three young ladies, on the 6th of May, 2013, rescued from a house in Cleveland, Ohio, after, after being missing for 10 years. You remember that story? Yeah. Amanda Berry, Gina DeJesus, Michelle Knight. At 2207 Seymour Avenue, Amanda Berry escaped with her child and she called 911. When the police arrived, they learned that there were two more missing young ladies in the house. Police officer went into the home, started up the stairs, and Michelle Knight looked down, peeked around the corner. She didn't know who she'd see. Would it be the man terrorizing us over and over? Is he coming back to terrorize us some more? She looked around the corner and she saw the police officer. And she ran down the stairs, and the police officer said, she embraced him and said, you've saved us, you've saved us, you've saved us. And Satan's keeping you in the house and he's threatening and he's abusing and he's misusing you and he is he, the Bible says he is nothing but a thief. He cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. He's told you a lot of lies about Jesus. Amen. But well, let me tell you who Jesus is. He's like that police officer. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You enter in, he, he comes in, you find freedom. Glory you escape God. Satan's trap. And you're finally set free. Amen? Trust Him. I promise you, He created you. He has not created you so He could just mess up your life. He created you for a purpose. Until you fulfill that purpose, you're never going to be satisfied. And you can do whatever you want. You say, preacher, I think I can, I can do it better this way. This, this is really what I want. You ask anybody. You keep trying to find what you want, you'll be miserable. But once you find out what he wants, amen? amen. There's nothing like knowing that you're in the will of God. Amen? amen. What, what's going to be your answer this morning? He's saying, let me in. By the way, he wants to come in not to terrorize you, but he wants to come in why? If you'll let me in, I'll sit down at the table and we can have sup together. We'll have a meal together and we'll have fellowship together. That's not a foe. That's a friend, right? And we can sit down and talk and you can share your cares and concerns and I can tell you about my heart and, and what I want and my will and, and that'll be a sweet time of fellowship. Listen, you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. Amen. If you know he's at the door, the best thing you can do is run and open the door Amen. and let him in. Amen? Amen? Now listen, if you're unsaved, uh, it, this is not really a, a message to the unsaved, it's a message to the saved, but it's still apl applicable. Amen? Amen? If you're unsaved, what you need to do is say, Jesus, come in my heart, forgive me and save me. Amen? Amen. But if you're a Christian, it's really applicable to you. When's the last time you just sat down with Jesus and spent time with him. And truth be known, for a lot of people, they'd say, Preacher, it's been a long I go to church, you know, and I do this, but it's been a long time since I opened my Bible and spent any time with God. And you need to be an altar this morning saying, God, I'm sorry. And I want to come today. As you if you've dealt with me, I want to open my heart's door and say, Come in, Jesus. I want fellowship with you. Would you do that today? Let's stand for prayer. Father now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Lord, you said it's our responsibility to come when you call. We know you're knocking today. And you're calling out to us. And we need to respond by saying, Lord, I come. I'm coming to you, Jesus. I want fellowship with you. Or if there have been any in this service today that are unsaved, help them this, this day to come to Christ and say, Jesus, I want you. Satan has lied about you. I, I want to come today and put my faith and trust in you. Lord, I pray for the saved that have just not had fellowship with you. They've been so wrapped up in this current corrupt world that they're not spending any time with Christ whatsoever. 
I pray God you'd grip their hearts and see, help them to see how vile that is, how awful that is that the Creator, the Christ, the coming King is there wanting fellowship with them and they just continue to ignore Him. God, I pray that you'd remind them of Proverbs chapter 1. You said there that you called and they, did, they refused to answer. And if they continue doing that, there's going to come a day that they're going to call and you won't answer them. And I pray, God, that they would settle that issue this morning, that they would call, they would respond to your call, so they'd not meet that dreadful day where they're crying out to you, but they have no answer from the Father. Help us in this invitation. Have your way. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. What page, Brenda?